Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is David Roberts, and I am a financial services partner at BDO, focusing on the insurance sector. I'm joined by my colleague, Mark Spencer, who leads our accounting advisory practice and sits on our global accounting steering group. And Mark will take you through accounting and financial reporting considerations as a result of COVID-19. Um, I suppose the first thing I wanted to say is, from all of us at BDO, we hope that you and your respective teams, families, and loved ones are safe and well during this difficult time. Uh, this um, webinar is part of, I suppose, us all getting on with things um, in that context. Over the past few weeks, we have been supporting our clients in responding to this crisis, and through this, together with ongoing conversations with the FCA, PRA, and trade bodies, uh, there have been quite a few um, dear CEO letters issued over the past few weeks alone, uh, we've gained insight that we're keen to share. Uh, it's worth noting that regulators in Europe are, are issuing similar pronouncements to the UK regulators, with these being largely consistent um, with what the, the UK regulators are saying. Before I hand over to Mark, I just wanted to touch on some housekeeping points. Today's webinar is going to be recorded, and we will circulate the slides later. Um, your lines will automatically be muted throughout the webinar. Uh, please submit your questions to the panel throughout the session using the Q&A box on the bottom right-hand side. Um, and please ensure that you send the questions to all panelists. Uh, we will try and cover as many of these as we can at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you're having any problems with the sound, please let us know via the Q&A box. So those are the only housekeeping points I had. Um, I think it's uh, over to you, Mark, now. David, thanks. Good morning, everybody. I am Mark Spencer, and I lead our financial services accounting advisory practice at BDO. First of all, thank you for joining us today for this webinar. Financial services accounting advisory at BDO spans all aspects of accounting and financial reporting across five pillars. These are accounting change, structuring advice, financial instruments accounting and reporting, climate and corporate reporting, and all other aspects of accounting. One thing that the financial services accounting advisory team at BDO has been doing since the onset of COVID-19 is engaging with financial reporting and prudential regulators in the EU, UK and the EU, trade bodies, our peers both locally and internationally, and other parts of the wider community on the implications of COVID-19 on accounting and corporate reporting. In terms of agenda, for the time that we have today, we will first be providing some context on the impact of COVID-19 in terms of accounting and corporate reporting. We will then focus on a fair amount of accounting and financial reporting considerations arising as a result of COVID-19 across a number of financial statement line items. Finally, we will also look at some annual reports and final considerations. This presentation contains some of the things that you should be thinking about in terms of your own annual reports and financial statements, as well as some of the things that you should consider in terms of your customer's financial position and performance. Before we move on, it is worth noting that at its April board meeting, the ISB agreed to extend the consultation period for some major ongoing consultations and delay publication of forthcoming major consultations that were originally planned for 2020. Example of the, examples of these are the exposure draft on general presentation disclosures, requests for information in terms of the comprehensive review of the IFS for SME standard, and the discussion paper on business combinations, disclosures, goodwill, and impairment. This is to provide some relief to preparers in these challenging times. The Financial Reporting Council has not done something similar 
on the accounting and financial reporting front, as it really only has the second phase of the interbank offered rate project, or colloquially known as LIBOR, on its agenda, which the ISB is pushing ahead with two, given the need for this to be delivered. As a result of transition from IBORs to alternative risk-free rates and the implications thereof on financial reporting. In terms of context, COVID-19 has unfortunately had an adverse impact on a large number of the world's economies. This will impact financial institutions differently in different jurisdictions, depending on, for example, the location of their borrowers and the sectors that they operate and work in, the location of policyholders and risks insured, and the location of investees and the sectors they operate in for investment houses and vehicles. The impacts of COVID-19 will be reflected in the financial statements. This requires the distinguishing between what is to be reflected in the financial statement in terms of the recognition and measurement, and what is considered to be a post-balance sheet event. The consensus is that COVID-19 is typically a post-balance sheet for 31st December 29 years ends, given the World Health Organization announced that COVID-19 was a global health emergency on the 30th of January 2020. The instance whereby it is not a post-balance sheet event for 31st December 2019 year end is those entities that, that have exposure to the Wuhan provision in China, which I'm assuming is not that many participants on this call. This means that detailed disclosure is warranted in financial statements and is considered as part of going concern assessments in those 31st December 2019 financial statements, but does not directly impact the numbers reported in the primary financial statements and disclosure notes. Considerations need to be given to the recognition and measurement of the impact of COVID for periods and 19 for periods ending on or after the 31st of January 2020. Remaining on the topic of context, because it is particularly important in light of the crisis, as I said, COVID-19 is generally a non-adjusting event for 31st December 2019 year ends, with one major exception, going concern assessments. Financial statements are prepared on a going concern basis unless the entity is not a going concern, with this being the case if the entity is being liquidated, seizing trading, or there is no realistic alternative to do otherwise. This is because the going concern of the entity is assessed for at least 12 months from the date of signing the financial statements. So, if a set of financial statements is signed on the 30th of April, then going concern will need to be assessed to at least the 30th of April 2021, and COVID-19 is unfortunately going to feature substantially in that time horizon. Going concern assessment should therefore always take into consideration adjusting post balance sheet events as a material. This is also why regulators are asking entities to delay filing their financial statements, so as this can be considered properly. What we see in practice is that entities model different scenarios and then probability weight them. In short, this is similar to what is being done for expected credit losses that are estimated in accordance with the requirements of IFS 9. With some Ducronian stress testing being applied, for example, not earning fees for three months with a reduced cost base, not writing any new insurance business, or not originating new loans. Different entities will clearly be impacted in different ways, with some more so than others. For example, monoline insurers in the building and content space may be impacted less given more people are at home, and those invested in pure online shopping companies and pharmaceutical companies may be impacted less so as well, if not to the extent that the impact on their business is a favourable one. Our advice is to identify the key business drivers, consider these in detail, and stress these. And I'll just pause here, David, to see if we have any pertinent questions on this point at this point in time, given it's such a pervasive one. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, nothing yet. So uh, I think if anyone has any questions around particularly the current concern aspects, um, perhaps save them up to the end. But Mark, I think you can carry on. Thank you, David. I will do. We now move to 
2020 accounting and financial reporting considerations. The first is impairment of non-financial assets. A number of non-financial assets are subject to either mandatory impairment testing or impairment testing if there is an indicator of impairment. The latter is the case under both IFRS and UK GAAP, with goodwill and intangibles that have indefinite useful lives needing to be tested for impairment annually under IFRS. Impairment testing is based on the current comparison of the recoverable amount to the carrying amount, with the latter being the amount that the item is being measured at as at that point in time. The recoverable amount is the higher of the value in use and fair value is less cost of disposal, with the latter being IFRS terminology, and fair value less cost to sell, which is FRS 1 and 2 terminology. Both the value in use and fair value less cost of disposal basis may be impacted as a result of COVID-19. Cash flows in the former may need rising downwards, but discount rates may need rising downwards as well, given interest rate cuts. Fair value less cost of disposal may decrease overall, given market participants are prepared to pay less. Furthermore, active markets may no longer exist, which may inhibit the ability to estimate fair value. IS 36 and Section 27 of IFRS 102 do not require multiple scenarios to be considered. However, in practice, given the circumstances, it may make sense to do so in order to properly estimate recoverable amounts for a larger number of impairment tests. This is because we're expecting larger indications of impairment of non-financial assets. And remember, the impairment tests are based on facts and circumstances that exist as at the reporting date. Impairment tests come with some detailed disclosure requirements, given the judgment and estimation uncertainty that is involved when it comes to estimating impairment, with these being more important than ever. On the appreciation, the current line of thinking is that this does not cease just because the asset is idle. The same applies to the depreciation of IFRS 16 right of use assets and the amortization of certain intangible assets. And when we say current line of thinking in this presentation, it is not because we expect this to change, but because standard setters may amend standards, with the accounting therefore then changing as a result. Sticking with impairment to an extent, investments in joint ventures and associates are measured using the equity method in consolidated financial statements. First of all, the carrying values of these interests will be impacted due to recognition of lower profits or even losses, or even greater losses. An impairment test is to be performed on the amount that is recorded after profits and losses have been recognized. This may reduce the carrying amount to nil, but no further than that. However, Additional losses may need to be recognised as a liability when the carrying amount is reduced to nil and the investor provides guarantees on behalf of its investee or commitments of support to that investee. Before all of this, though, the entity needs to assess whether the interest is a debt asset, that is a loan, or an equity asset, that is a more typical investment. And we say this because sometimes an investor could invest in, could issue debt to its, um, it could hold debt in its associate or joint venture, and it could also hold equity shares. And in relation to loans that is granted to its associate or joint venture, then the IFRS line expected credit loss model applies under IFRS, or section 11 or IS39 in care credit loss models under UK GAAP are to be applied to that loan. Remember, UK GAAP preparers can still elect to apply either sections 11 or 12 of IFRS 102, IS39 or IFRS 9 when it comes to the recognition and measurement of financial statements, financial instruments. This election applies to all financial instruments and as I said before, it is applied before the application of the equity method. As a result of COVID-19, there may be indicators of impairment for equity interest in joint ventures and associates. And we're expecting more so of this in terms of both debt and equity. 
In terms of Leicester County, we will focus primarily on IFRS 16 and Lassia County, as this is an area of significant change for a number of financial statements for periods ending on or after 31st December 2019. In this similar vein to the previous two slides, there may be more indicators of impairments of right to use assets. The amount of lease contract penalties that may come to effect is less likely to be considered insignificant in light of the crisis. However, landlords are offering concessions to lessees as a result of the outbreak. Such normally give rise to the need to reassess the lease term and or remeasure the lease liability and associated right of use asset. This is because of the lease modification accounting requirements that typically apply in such situations. The ISB board, though, discussed a narrow scope amendment to the lease modification requirements of IFRS 16 on Friday for lessees and we're expecting an exposure draft to be issued on this by Monday, if not before. This will have a very accelerated 14-day common period, so that the ISB can issue this sometime in May. Typically, um, exposure drafts have either a 120-day common period, 90-day period, common period, or a 45-day common period. So this is very quick in terms of the ISB in order to provide relief to preparers. This is so that entities that have, say, a 31st March year end and have not filed their financial statements by the time the amendments are out could still apply them. That is, if the amendment has been endorsed by the EU before then, because you can only early adopt an amendment if the EU has endorsed it. There is an expectation, though, that the EU will accelerate the endorsement of this relief. While we have not seen the wording of this amendment, we are expecting it to exempt leases in the books of the lessee. We're expecting lease lessees to assess whether COVID-19 related rent concessions, which are a lease contract modification, not to apply IFRS 16 lease modifications. This means that effectively, the COVID-19 related rent concession will be treated as a variable lease payment, that is a credit or a lower debit will be recognized in profit or loss due to, say, a rent holiday, rather to assessing the modification and the impacts of that in terms of de-recognition and re-recognition. The availing of this exemption requires disclosure in the financial statements. It is to be applied retrospectively, that is from 1st January 2020, but it does not require restatements of comparatives. The impact of this narrow scope amendment will be reflected as an adjustment to open and retained earnings, which is similar to how IFRS 16 could have been applied at the date of its initial application, which was first January 2019 using the modified retrospective approach. Please note that this narrow scope amendment is envisaged to only apply to COVID-19 related rent concessions that are granted in 2020 and not 2021. Accounting for such concessions will de depend on the precise terms of the lease contract and the nature of the concessions, though. This is still the significant release to lessees, given the change they have gone through during 2019 as part of adopting IFRS 16, particularly those lessees with multiple leases. These entities do not need to re-review a substantial number of releases for modifications and reassess their lease terms or remeasure their lease liabilities and associated right to lease assets if it can avail of the exemption because the COVID-19 lease, lease concession is because of COVID-19. We all need to see what the exposure draft of this narrow scope amendment actually states when it is issued. What I have outlined is based on what we're expecting it to say. Less or accounting remains unchanged. The ISB took this view as IFRS 16 did not introduce changes for lessors, given IFRS 9 expected credit losses applied to lease receivables, receivables recognised under IS 17 with effect from 1st January 2018. So this is already in effect and would not give rise to a change for preparers. Moving on to financial instruments accounting, we will focus primarily on UK GAAP and IS 39, given we ran a webinar on the impact of COVID-19 on IFRS 9 last Thursday. A recording of that webinar is available and will be shared with you after this webinar as well. There are increased instances of borrowers requesting lenders to modify the terms of the loan contracts, which can take various forms. For example, reduced interest rates, payment holidays, and covenant waivers. 
IS-39, Section 11 of West France 102, and IS-39 have broadly similar requirements for modifications, whereby this may need to be assessed in both qualitative and quantitative terms as to whether the financial instrument is a new one or a modified one. It is ambiguous that a fair number of contractual modifications will not be to the extent that the original financial instrument is derecognized and a new financial instrument is recognized. This is given the nature of the contractual modifications to loan agreements that are arising as a result of COVID-19. It is to be said, though, that losses are still expected to arise in lenders' financial statements when the contractual terms of financial assets are modified as the modified carrying amount is likely to be lower than the original carrying amount due to the deferring of cash flows and or reducing of interest rates. The converse also applies with gains expecting to arise in borrowers' financial statements. One point on hedge accounting, forecast transactions under a cash flow hedge may no longer be highly probable, which would give rise to increased ineffectiveness, or may not be probable, which would give rise to hedge discontinuance and recycling of the cash flow hedge reserve. The PRA has written to lenders on the application of IFRS long given COVID-19. While this letter of the 26th of March focuses on the forward-looking elements of the IFRS line expected credit loss model, parts thereof can be applied to IS39 or Section 11 of FRS 102 in care credit loss models. For example, actions to support borrowers may not necessarily automatically give rise to default under these two letter standards, latter standards, or under CRR. This applies to both individual assessments, say for corporates or large SME loans, and collective assessments for smaller SME loans and retail and consumer credit portfolios. COVID-19 induced forbearance is to be assessed as to whether they are indicative of credit deterioration or a lack of short-term liquidity. Credit risk exposures that were on the edge of default before the onset of COVID-19 are more likely to now be considered as being credit impaired as a result. However, if the credit risk exposure was not on the edge of default before the onset of credit COVID-19, then it is not likely that it will be considered credit impaired as the result of the provision of the forbearance, because this is observed to be related to short-term liquidity issues and not credit deterioration. The PRA also specifically spoke about covenants given in all these plain loan agreements. Similar to forbearance, lenders need to determine whether these are normal or COVID-19 induced covenant breaches. Examples of COVID-19 induced covenant breaches are temporary changes in borrowers' reported earnings, suspension of business or other material adverse event clauses, and modification of the order report attached to the audited financial statements. These also include delays associated with the provision of financial statements, compliance certificates, and valuations that are required by third party. I like to think of these current breaches as being similar to payments not hitting accounts for issues with technological systems, which would not be considered to be indicative of a borrower's inability to meet their repayment obligation if the non-payment is rectified within a specified time frame, such as three days. As a result, the PRA understandably asked lenders to consider covenant breaches carefully during the outbreak. This is similar to the underlying theme of to determine whether the breach or waiver is due to credit deterioration or a lack of short term liquidity. The PRA is clear in that COVID-19 induced covenant breaches should be waived. The PRA is also clear in its letter to, to CEOs that when doing so, then this should not introduce new charges or restrictions on borrowers which are unrelated to the facts and circumstances that led to that breach. Whilst the PRA is aimed at entities that this regulates, I would still advise entities, other entities, to consider what we have just said, given it is considered to be good market practice. And also, markets will come to expect it as well. Defined benefit schemes may be doubly impacted as a result of the outbreak. First of all, interest rates have been cut significantly, which means that a lower discount rate is being applied to the funding obligation, so the liability is high. Secondly, the fair value of plan assets are generally expected to increase in line with market activity and uncertainty. This means that the pension deficits are expected to increase overall. 
Termination benefits are required to be recognised as and when employees are made redundant. These benefits are to be recognised in the financial statements as they can no longer be withdrawn. That is to say, they are contractually binding. Or, once communicated to the affected employees in sufficient detail that they can no longer be withdrawn, even if there is no contract in place here. The latter is known as a constructive obligation. 2019 bonuses that are based on 31st December 2019 year end financial performance and were waived subsequent to 31st December 2019 are still to be recognised in the 31st December 2019 financial statements unless there was a contractual callback provision as at 31st December 2019. I know that there's a lot of 2019s in that statement, but it is important. So that means if the bonus is based on 2019 year performance and there is no contractual callback as at 31st December 2019, and then it is waived, then the credit for the reversal of that bonus will be recognised in 2020. We don't recognise that reversal in 2019 in such an instance. On furloughed staff, the employee costs are still treated as an expense, regardless if this is the lower of the 80% in £2,500 per month, or 80% plus a top-up for some or all of the 20%. The government contribution is to be accounted for as a government income grant. The payable to employees and the receivable from the government are presented gross on the balance sheet under both IFRS and UK GAAP. The income from the government is presented gross from the employee cost under UK GAAP, but can be netted off against the employee cost under IFRS. So the difference between IFRS and UK GAAP is you can avail of net presentation of the profit and loss by reducing employee expense by the amount of the government income grants, while under UK GAAP, you must show both gross in the PL. Employee numbers and staff costs are still to be disclosed based on the respective provisions of the Companies Act of 2006. What I have just outlined in terms of following applies to instances, instances where the date of return to work is known at the point of furloughing. It is less clear whether a liability exists if there is a stand-ready obligation for employees to return at an unknown date in the future. And this is an area that is currently being debated. No onerous contract provisions are expected to apply when staff are fair of them. If it is not a result of a constructive or a contractual obligation. I touched on contractual and constructive obligations in relation to termination benefits on the previous slide, but these may exist in a number of other instances when contracts become onerous. An example of an onerous contract is a purchase contract for which no benefit will now be obtained by the entity. While an entity may be insured for the losses arising from the onerous contract, the recovery then may end up being recognised later, and this may include in a subsequent financial reporting period, as it is only recognised when it is virtually certain to be received. Future operating losses cannot be recognised though under both IFRS and UK GAAP. However, losses arising due to onerous contracts are to be recognised when the costs are contractually unavoidable and in excess of benefits that are expected to be derived if any. And the key term here is the contractually unavoidable term. For example, obligations to pay advertising costs after period end with no callback will be recognised as a liability at the time of termination of the advertising programme as it would be onerous and not accrued an expense in the subsequent reporting period. Service payment compensation schemes require assessment of whether vesting conditions have been satisfied or not. The likelihood of these vesting conditions may have changed as a result of COVID-19. Before we look at this, I would just like to say that chair-based payment compensation schemes may also be modified as a result of COVID-19, and such modifications need to be accounted for in accordance with the requirements of IFRS 2 and UK GAAP. In terms of vesting conditions, these need to be understood as to what they relate to. Conditions that relate to service and will now not be met give rise to forfeiture accounting, which means that the accumulated expense that has been recognised in prior periods are reversed in profit and loss in the current year. Conditions that relate to market conditions, for example, a target market price for the entity's equity instruments not being met, 
and other performance conditions, for example, a target to IPO within three years not being met, do not give rise, do not result in applying forfeiture accounting. There may also be an increased number of good movers given the circumstances. In terms of where all these debits to profits and loss are presented, we're expecting to see a larger amount of exceptional items being disclosed given COVID-19. And I'll just take a slight pause here, David, to just see if we have any pertinent questions on what we have covered since going from chain. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, no, we have a couple of questions, but they are actually around the kind of cutoff point of um, uh, adjusting post-balance sheet event and non-adjusting post-balance sheet event. And I think what I'd rather do is see if when you get to the end, there is a theme there that we can um, talk to to answer all the questions on that subject in one go. So I think you could just carry on. Thank you very much, David. That sounds very simple. We will now look at income taxes, particularly deferred tax. Deferred tax is recognised when there is a difference between the carrying amount used for financial reporting purposes and the tax base used for tax computation purposes. Deductible temporary differences result in amounts of deductible in determining taxable profit of future periods when the carrying amount of the asset or liability is recovered or settled. Deferred tax assets can be recognised when there are deductible temporary differences or tax losses that have not been fully utilised in the year that they arise. Deferred tax assets can only be recognised, though, if they will be recovered in future periods. In light of COVID-19, it is envisaged that less deferred tax assets will be recognised as they do not meet the recognition criteria. Entities will need to assess their ability to recover deferred tax assets in subsequent reporting periods. Again, forecasts will need to be stressed more so than has been done previously. Simply recognising tax losses as the deductible temporary differences have no expiry date or a very long-term expiry date is not sufficient ground in itself for recognising the deferred tax asset. This thought process applies to both assessments of the continued ability to recover deferred tax assets that are brought forward from prior years and those that are potentially arising in the current years. Fair values are measured based on a market participant's view. And the fair value measurements of Section 12 of IFRS 102 and IFRS 13 apply to a number of instances where fair value is the basis for determining the, covering, the, covering, the carrying amount, such as fair value less cost of disposal and impairment testing, fair value of investment property, and so on and so forth. Fair values are measured based on a market participant's view. Markets are becoming increasingly volatile. These linked markets may also not be as active as they were before the outbreak. The fair value hierarchy level of assets and liabilities may change as a result. And just to remind you, level one is for instruments that are quoted in active markets. Level two is for instruments that are valued using a valuation technique that primarily consists of observable inputs. And level three is fair value estimated using a technique that makes use of significant unobservable inputs. And significant is relevant to the overall fair value, not, for example, financial statement materiality. As I said, the fair value high level of asset and liabilities may change as a result, with more moving from level one to level two, and level two to level three. Increased disclosure will be required as a result. Distressed sales are to be factored into the fair value recognized, i.e. it decreased, if it is envisaged that the investment will not be held until its fair value recovers. It is worth bearing in mind that similar to the credit crisis, the decline of activity in a market does not necessarily mean that the price is no longer observable. The basis on which assets are classified as current or non-current is different to that of liability. Assets may no longer be consumed or realized during the entity's normal operating cycle, with this requiring, requiring them to be reclassified as non-current. Liabilities, however, may be current due to breaches of contractual terms and covenants. 
This is because the classification of liabilities is largely driven by the ability to exercise rights to fair repayment, but asset classification is based on expectations of consumption and realization. So liabilities are based on rights and assets are based on expectations. As we said earlier, the PRA is expecting lenders to waive COVID-19 induced covenant breaches if government fiscal measures mean that covenants can no longer still be met, given the implications associated with waiving covenant breaches or breaching covenants generally. And when I said rights right before in relation to liabilities, it is driven by contractual rights when expectations do not need to be contractual for assets, which is quite a difference in terms of classification. An amendment to the classification of liabilities as current or non-current under IS, IS1 was due to become effective on 1st January 2022. The ISB, though, is proposing to defer this amendment's effective date to 1st January 2023 to give preparers fair relief. Remaining on the topic of presentation of financial statements, sales of non-current assets or disposal groups may no longer meet the highly probable criteria, given the uncertainty that is associated with COVID-19. Various reasons could give rise to this, such as the disappearance of markets for the items or lack of buyers. It is envisaged that there may be more discontinued operations, though, with these needing to be presented and disclosed separately. Non-current assets or disposal groups that are not to be principally recovered through sale but and abandonment are not to be classified as held for sale, but would constitute a discontinued operation. More assets may be classified as held for sale as entities would need to liquidate them given the outbreak. And, as I said, more lines of business may be exited, giving rise to more discontinued operation. Risk associated with financial estimates, instruments sorry, require a fair amount of disclosure under both IFRS and UK GAAP. As a result of COVID-19, this may need to be expanded across credit, liquidity and market risk. The credit risk associated with financial assets may increase, requiring disclosure thereof. Liquidity risk disclosures may need additional thought and commentary, given a lack of liquidity may significantly impact the entity's ability to operate. And currency, interest rates, equity and commodity markets are becoming more volatile due to uncertainty, meaning some operations will be significantly impacted as a result. For example, multi-jurisdictional financial institutions will be exposed to fluctuations in exchange rates, entities with more debt will be exposed to cash flow and fair value interest rate risk, broker dealers will be impacted by changes in commodity prices, and investment houses listed equity holdings will be subject to greater market movements. Defaults and breaches also require disclosure. These increased disclosures will be in both qualitative and quantitative terms. For example, the basis on which sensitive analysis is prepared and the basis point shifts to assumptions thereto may need revisiting and rethinking. We therefore advise you to consider your material financial risk exposures in greater detail than prior years. Financial risk exposures may be impacted in more than one way, and some that were not previously significant may well now be significant. We have spent a fair amount of time talking through annual financial statement considerations, but interim financial reports are impacted by COVID-19 as well. The interim financial report is intended to provide an update on the latest complete set of annual financial statements. Accordingly, it focuses on new activities, events and circumstances, and does not duplicate information that has been previously reported. And these interim financial reports can be half yearly interims or quarterly interims. Given the timing of COVID-19, it is expected that there will be significant disclosure of the impact of the outbreak in internal financial reports for calendar year ends and on an ongoing basis. This includes consideration across both recognition and measurement. Some impacts recognizing interim periods may be reversed at year end, but others may not. For example, impairment of property, plant and equipment that is impaired in an interim period can be reversed. However, the impairment of goodwill cannot be under IFRS. Entities are to avail of release being offered in relation to the deadlines by which regulatory filings are required to be submitted. We will touch on some of these reliefs in three slides time. We will now look at some corporate reporting considerations. These are aimed at the annual report or what is colloquially referred to as the front half. 
First of all, please remember that the Financial Reporting Council is the national authority and therefore regulator of financial reporting in the UK. The Financial Reporting Council has issued a number of pronouncements given the outbreak and we urge you to read these. Entities need to maintain good corporate governance practices, management of information flows, and risk management processes in spite of the outbreak. This is because this is needed more so than ever due to disruptions to operations and changing practices. Management information reporting is to be maintained and missing information made good for. Entities are to ensure that they have sufficient distributable reserves before announcing dividends. This applies to both interim and annual dividends. This is particularly important for financial institutions given regulatory capital and solvency considerations. New alternative performance measures may be used to explain the effects of the virus on the business. However, please be mindful of the Financial Reporting Council's thematic review findings on this area that are available online. Please also be mindful that we, still, we are still subject to the European Securities and Markets Authority pronouncements on alternative performance measures until at least the 31st of December 2020. The Financial Reporting Council has reminded preparers that strategic reports are to be forward-looking and tend to the entity, that is to say, not boilerplate. That which is under threat in terms of resources, assets and relationships are to be disclosed, as well as actions taken by the entity to mitigate these threats. There is therefore firm expectations that principal risk and uncertainty disclosures will address the impact of COVID-19 in a fair amount of detail. Viability statements are required for listed entities that cover a longer term horizon than 12 months from the date of signing of the financial statements. Any qualifications or assumptions made in preparing such statements are to be clearly disclosed. Clarity is also needed in terms of specific circumstances and a degree of uncertainty about the future. In terms of going concern, the messaging from the Financial Reporting Council is the same as referred to in terms of the assessment of the basis on which financial statements are to be prepared that I talked through earlier on in this presentation. Disclosures for material uncertainties is an area of additional consideration. I think worth bearing in mind is that if the Board of Directors conclude that there is not a material uncertainty that meets the disclosure criteria, but this conclusion required the application of significant judgment, then this judgment is to be disclosed. Disclosure of critical accounting judgments and sources of estimation uncertainty also require disclosure in the financial statements under IFRS and UK GAAP, with some of the considerations for board, boards being on your screens at the moment. On events after the reporting date, the Financial Reporting Council has reminded entities that consideration of how much of the impact of COVID-19 is to arise from non-adjusting events for subsequent reporting dates also requires the exercise of judgment. This extends to both amounts reported and, for non-adjusting events, disclosure of both the nature of the event and either estimates of the financial impact of the event or an assertion that quantification of the impact is not possible. Finally, the publication and filing dates of annual financial statements and preliminary financial statements have been pushed back in certain instances. Fully listed entities now have an additional two months in which to publish their financial statements, taking this to a total of six months from the year-end date. This applies to debt listings on regulated markets, such as the FTSE, and not just equity listings that are also on regulated markets. Entities can apply to companies' house for a three-month filing extension. You do need to apply for this extension in order to get it. A 31st December 2019 year end can therefore now file its annual financial statements on the 31st of December 2020 instead of the 30th of September 2020. No such extensions have been granted to FCA regulated investment businesses. These annual financial statements still need to be filed with the FCA by Saturday. There are resources on both accounting and corporate reporting and COVID-19 on our UK and global website. There are David and my contact details on the screen should you want to discuss this or any accounting and corporate reporting matter further. But may I remind you that the slides and therefore our contact details as well as the recording of this webinar will be circulated after the event. And on that note, I thank you very much for your kind attention. I hope that you have found this useful and that you continue to keep safe and stay well. We will now take a few questions. David. 
Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, we have got uh, a couple of questions which um, I think it will be worth exploring, but I'll give you a moment to catch your breath. Um, the, the first sort of area of questioning has been, as I mentioned um, when you broke off to ask me a few minutes ago, it, it, around basically the cutoff points at which um, COVID-19 moves from being, uh, well, firstly, a pre-balance sheet event or a post-balance sheet event to a pre-balance sheet event, um, and uh, secondly, whether or not adjustment is required. The, a specific question has been asked based on a 29 February year end, but I think it might be worth um, just going over if we can, and I appreciate that actually there are some grey areas here, uh, what the kind of factors would be that would lead um, uh, management to conclude that if they had a 31 January year end, the event was either pre or post balance sheet, and then if they have a 29 February year end, uh, whether it was pre or post balance sheet. Uh, is that something that you think you can comment on? Yes, happy to, David. Um, and I'll just do it for 31st December year end, and then I'll do it for 31st March year end. Um, in terms of a 31st December year end, 2019 obviously, not 2020, a pre-balance sheet event is anything that happens before 31st December. So that the, the event has actually arisen and it's manifested as at the reporting date. And that also applies to a 31st March year end. If we then come to January for a 31st December year end, then one needs to consider whether it's an adjusting event or non-adjusting event. And IS-10 and equivalent provisions in FRS 102 outline what is an adjusting event and what is a non-adjusting event. An adjusting event is something that is indic indicative of facts and circumstances that existed as at the reporting date, but have only crystallized after year end. So you had an idea it was going to happen, and it's then happened. For example, you have a court case, uh, you think that the judgment is going to go against you on the 31st of December, and you receive that verdict in January, and it's gone against you. A non-adjusting event is a, would be a pure 2020 event or transaction. Um, so if we were to take COVID-19, for example, there is consensus that COVID-19 is not an adjusting event for 31st December 2019 year end, except for those entities that have operations linked with the Wuhan province or their reliance on the Wuhan province for their supply chain management resources, staff, what have you. Um, so for most preparers, it is a non-adjusting event in terms of 31st December 2019 year end. If we were to move the clock forward a bit, um, and February is very much a grey area, um, as is March. However, the consensus has started to move as time progresses. And I know there's a bit of a lag here, but governments were already starting to take measures in the first quarter of 2020. For example, um, the FCO was asking people to return home to the UK in March and February. Other countries were doing the same. So events are a bit more clearer in terms of whether they are not they're happening. So I would say that whilst there is a consensus lag at 29 February or 31st March, the events are very much alive and amongst us. Now, a key thing I would advise clients to do is to try as much as possible to crystallize the use of data as at the reporting date. And I understand and appreciate that economic data comes out in April or May that relates to March. However, there could be an element of hindsight in that data. So I would advise that information data that is available as at the reporting date is captured, and then anything arising that is assessed to determine whether or not it is indicative of or adds further light on conditions that exist at the reporting date, or it's more new information. So as and when the later information comes out, it's probably less likely to be an adjusting event. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you, Mark. Uh, leading on to a slightly more specific point, uh, this is uh, for a, an investment trust um, with a, uh, a 31 December year end. The question really, and I think you've probably answered it, but let's uh, be, be specific about it. The question really is um, where you are holding uh, investments in portfolio companies, um, 
should you be using hindsight uh, to value them as at 31 December 19? And I think what I'm hearing is no, but would you like to talk to that as well? Yes, David. I mean, I, 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 and I agree with you. The, the answer is no. Um, you don't use hindsight in accounting. Uh, the only time you use hindsight in accounting is when a new standard comes into play and a standard says that you can take into consideration as a practical expedient what has happened. For example, if you have options in these terms, you can apply hindsight as to whether or not they exercise. Um, but no, the, the, uh, I think the position very much is you do not apply hindsight evaluations. Anything that has manifested after year end is a non-adjusting event to the extent that this is not indicative of facts and circumstances. I think this is a reporting date, and I'm struggling to see how one could argue, unless these are very specific companies, such as Chinese companies or companies operating in the region that were adversely impacted, I would say that you would not use hindsight in determining those fair values. I think, I think that's very clear, Mark. Thank you. Um, the next sort of area that we, that we have some query on is um, the level of disclosure. Uh, but I'm going to start actually with a very specific question that's been asked within that, which is what level of additional going concern disclosure is required for non-audited entities? Um, and I think obviously the distinction here is between what are the obligations from a financial reporting point of view as opposed to those from an auditing point of view. Um, I mean, what I'd refer to here, David, is first of all, directors' obligations um, in a fiduciary capacity. Um, directors are still responsible for directing the operations of their companies. And I think entities will still need to go through the thought process. Um, and, and, and let's just be clear here. Um, the management will come up with a going concern assessment for the entity and then auditors audit it. Um, but the fact that auditors are not auditing, it does not really change um, what management needs to do. Um, so I'd still say what we've spoken about in terms of going concern what's called true. Um, it does depend on the nature of the entity's operations, but I would still identify what are the key areas of its operations, what could be more adversely impacted or favorably impacted, depending on what the operations are, as a result of the outbreak, and stripping those. And I know that some, some people in the market are applying quite draconian stresses to get comfortable, to get over the line that the entity is still a going concern and that those financial statements can be prepared on a going concern basis as opposed to a non-going concern basis. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, I think I uh, can hardly, need hardly say that I completely agree with that. The obligation is on management. And the auditors merely audit what management have done, albeit that in my experience over this last reporting period, um, I think pressure, if I can put it that way, from auditors has made a difference to um, the level of uh, assessment and and um, sensitivity analysis that management has actually done. Um, if I may, David, on that point, um, I mean, a key thing is material uncertainties. I mean, I, mean I, I, I understand and appreciate that preparers would not like to include material uncertainties in their financial statements. However, the, they are required to if there are material uncertainties related to going concern. And this is, this is lifting the bonnet, saying, looking at what could go wrong. And regulators are being quite clear that material uncertainties are going to be the new normal for a period of time. And they're doing that, they're issuing that thing to the market so as the market does not get a bit spooked by an increased number of material uncertainties. It could become the case whereby people start to question instances whereby a material uncertainty is not disclosed. Um, and it goes back to the point that I made about the need to disclose the judgments exercised when concluding that there is no material uncertainty and the entity is a going concern. And that, thank you, Mark, that leads us actually on very neatly to um, a, a, a kind of follow-up question, uh, which is that you've mentioned um, modified audit reports uh, in the light of going concern. Uh, is it worth talking through the, the kind of decision tree which um, an auditor would 
uh, go through in order to determine whether and how um, an audit report should be modified, probably distinguishing between uh, the cases where um, an auditor is issuing an extended audit report, so for a public interest entity, for instance, and those where uh, it's a what you might call a standard audit report. So oh, happy to, David. Um, and again, this is a common question that we are seeing in practice. If I may start with an extended audit report, there is a specific section in that report that relates to going concern. So it, let's assume that management have done their going concern assessment. They're concluding that the going concern basis is appropriate for the preparation of the financial statements. And it's also, they've also disclosed um, sufficient and adequate disclosures on the uncertainties associated with the entity's ability to go in concern, continue to go in concern. In that instance, the auditor would highlight and cross refer to those material uncertainties, and that is a requirement for auditors to do. I mean, it doesn't mean that management's done anything wrong. It's a requirement to highlight those uncertainties um, that management have flagged. If it is not a public interest entity, then it does not have an extended audit report. Um, and that means that what the auditors would do then is, in a similar manner, if there are uncertainties about going concern basis, then they would probably include an emphasis of the matter in the audit report. Again, that would be highlighting, look, we refer to note X and Y, whereby management have talked about the uncertainties associated with going concern, um, and we have nothing to add in this respect. If, however, management have not done what they're required to do, i.e. consider this over a 12-month horizon, at least from the reporting date, for example, or they haven't done sufficient work to assert that the entities are going concerned, then we start to become in modified audit report territory. And that could either be a disagreement with management, um, or it could be disclaimer of opinion if that is so pervasive in terms of the amounts recognized in the financial statements, um, or it could be an except for um, if it relates to very particular instances. But given we're talking about going concern, I'm skeptical that we would be an except for territory. I think it would be more a disagreement with, man disagreement with management. The auditors does not agree with what the management have done to justify the entity to continue as a going concern operation, or um, it, that sufficient work hasn't been done by management in which the auditor conclude that the entity is a going concern. Thank you, Mark. Um, if I could just add what, one thing from, again from personal experience in this reporting season. I think th the way this has worked out in practice is that auditors and management have discussed uh, what is necessary or appropriate or sufficient uh, by way of assessment from management and by way of disclosure. So the most likely outcomes are, as Mark says, in an extended audit report, a reference in the going concern section, which is not a qualification, or in a non-extended audit report, a standard audit report, an emphasis of matter, which again is not a qualification. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that we are uh, up against the end of our um, allotted time span. So um, well, I think we're reaching the end of, uh, uh, of this webinar. So I just wanted to share a couple of final thoughts with you before closing. Um, any questions we haven't answered, uh, we will do so following this webinar. And thank you for submitting questions, which have um, helped us explain some of the points that Mark uh, was making through the um, through the main script. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we're recording this webinar, and we will be sending you a copy of the recording and slides over the coming days. Um, also, we are running a series of webinars, and uh, we'd be grateful to hear from you what you thought of today's presentation and any subject matters that you'd like to hear about in the future so that we can factor your views and your preferences into our program. Lastly, I'd like to thank Mark for uh, presenting and all of you for joining us this morning. And uh, in closing, I would just wish you a safe and good and prosperous remainder of your day. Goodbye, everyone.